So I gave you an assignment last week. Oh, no. And I sent you reminders. So I'd like to ask a question. Who gave a witness this week? If you, if you gave a witness this week, raise your hand. Oh, I had a little pressure today. If you gave a witness, raise your hand. Okay, what's wrong with that answer? What's wrong with that answer? If you're a follower of Jesus, you gave a witness. Oh, yeah. Because you are a witness. Remember, it's a noun. That's who you are. Now, did you give an effective witness is another story. Right? So you are all witnesses. When you, when you leave this room, you're entering into your mission field, and you are going to be a witness today. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's who you are. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. Not the verb. I mean, two witnesses is a verb, right? But you are a witness. So I'm going to ask it again next week. And I will remind you with my lovingly kind, pleasantly persistent emails to pray. So we continue in our sermon series called God Talk. I changed the name of the sermon, Having Effective Spiritual Conversations. We just don't want to have spiritual conversations. We want to have effective or impactful um, conversations. Our text is John 4, where Jesus has an impactful, effective spiritual conversation with a woman who is really hurting. And we learn from Jesus how to be an effective uh, witness uh, of the good news. And I'm going to use five symbols, heart, feet, ears, mouth, and eyes. Now, the story starts out with Jesus walking from southern Israel, Jerusalem, to Galilee. The disciple John writes these words in John 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. The text says Jesus had to go through Samaria. Actually, he did not have to go through Samaria. There was another way that most devout Jews took. This is a map of Israel, Galilee, Samaria, G uh, Judea. I remember the three reasoned regions by God sent Jesus. Cute, huh? Galilee, Judea, Galilee, Samaria, uh, Judea. God sent Jesus. The red marks how Jews would typically go to Galilee. They'd take six days to go around rather than three days going through. Why? The Jews despised Samaritans. They despised Samaritans so much, they didn't even want to put their foot on their land. So Jews typically would go around, taking six days. Jesus went on the white path. He had to. He had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to because there wasn't another way. There was another way. He had to go through Samaria because there was one woman who had lost her way. And that's why Jesus had to go. In telling the story, right off the bat, Jesus had to go through Samaria. And, and for one woman, it, it reminds us that every single person matters. Every single person matters. The kingdom of God, for all of its glory, for all of its power, for all of its awe, for all of its inhabitants, of every nation, tribe, and tongue, advances one person at a time. A time. You and I may not be able to affect nations and tribes and the whole world, but we can affect one person. One person matters. And that's why having effective spiritual conversations is so important for them and for us and our faith. Our story continues in John 4, beginning in verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So it's about noon, and again, the uh, topography and temperature of the country of Israel is, is very tip, uh, uh, similar to ours. In the summer, it's hot, and at noon, it's, it's hot. And tired and thirsty, Jesus is from his journey, he sits down by a well, and a woman approaches. Now, what any respectable Jewish man would do was get up and walk away. It was forbidden to be seen in the presence of any woman, let alone a Samaritan woman. And to talk with a Samaritan woman, to engage in conversation, was absolutely scandalous, especially for someone like Jesus, who's supposed to be so holy, who's supposed to be so different, who's to, supposed to keep himself away, if you're a good Jewish person, from unholy people. But Jesus is a boundary breaker. He is a rule breaker, actually. And this would be an offensive and shocking story, but Jesus does it. And here is a scene where God so loving the world is not just seen in theory, but in practice. Jesus is so loving the world. He sits down, he humbles himself and asks her for a drink. Speaks to her, a woman in Samaria. And that's why Jesus had to go. And this is where spiritual conversations start. They start in the heart. It's a heart of compassion that leads to a sense of urgency. This is where effective spiritual conversations happen. This is where dynamic churches start that have a powerful outreach to the community and to the area and to the world. It starts with an attitude. It starts in our hearts. Marketing and technique and all those things are important, but they're not as important, they're not as critical as nurturing, as developing a heart of compassion that has a sense of urgency, that has a sense of urgency. This Jesus shows here and time and time again. Uh, once Jesus was approaching the city of Jerusalem and his heart was filled with compassion and he cried out, it says this, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it and he said, if you, even you, can't you sense his heart of compassion? Can't you sense his sense of urgency? If you, even you, had only known on that, this day what would bring you peace. He looked at the city of Jerusalem and he knew that people were going to reject him and kill him. And he just wept. He broke down and wept. He said, oh, if you just only knew, if you only knew, there are people in your life, there are people in my life that I pray that we would, we would see them the way Jesus see them, with a, with a heart of compassion, not a heart of judgment, not a heart, I'm better than you, I know what you don't know. But just a, a heart of Compassion that leads to a sense of urgency if you, if you, only, if you only knew. There was a season in my, my life where, where Christians were praying for me and, and trying to share their faith with me because they said, oh, Jamie, if you only knew. And I'm so thankful that they uh, persisted uh, in my uh, saying no thank you. It was much harsher than no thank you, but hey. Being an effective witness, just like we said last week in 1 Peter, Peter says, you know, in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared. But it starts in our hearts. It starts in our hearts. Nurturing a heart of compassion that leads to action, that leads to a sense of urgency. Compassion is not compassion if we don't act. Compassion is... The Greek word has in its sense, it really means you feel something deep within your guts and you act on it. If you don't act on it, it's not compassion, it's just sympathy or an uh, empathetic feeling. But Jesus and God, God is called the father of compassion. He feels, but he acts on that feeling. That is compassion. Uh, Matthew puts it this way, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion. He felt something deep within his guts and then he did something about it. He healed their sick. 
Or in my favorite story in the parable of the, the running father and the running, runaway sons or the prodigal sons, it says his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He did something about it. So the American, Samaritan woman came to the well. Jesus' his heart is filled with compassion. He looks at her. He asks her for a drink of water. She was shocked that he would even look at her, let alone talk with her. And then Jesus says this, if you knew the gift of God. Again, can't you feel the, the, the if you only knew. If you, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink and who it is, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water if you knew the gift of God. So here's a question. Do, do we have a sense of urgency? Do you have a sense of urgency? Do I have a sense of urgency? Sometimes. But the urgency cup leaks all the time, doesn't it? Right? I mean, almost you walk out the door and the urgency cup leads. So one of the reasons we gather every week or in Bible study or in prayer or, to, or meet together is just kind of keep filling that urgency, that heart of compassion that does something about it, that does something, that acts. The woman did not know the gift of God. She didn't know. And how, how is she going to know the gift of God? Someone had to go to her because she's not coming to church down in Jerusalem. There are lots of people that aren't coming to church here. We do want them to come to church here. We do have events that we invite them to, Christmas Eve, come and see Sundays, um, uh, Easter. Oh, yeah, that day, <laughs> Easter, right? But, but mostly the, the, the Samaritans are out there. And so... Uh, that's what Jesus did. He went to her. So having effective conversations not only is about hearts of compassion, but also feet that travel to other people. Hearts of compassion, but, but feet that travel to other people. So here's another question. Where do you need to go? Where are you already? Where, where, where are you right now in, in community or in connection with other people, your neighbors, uh, uh, other family members, kids on your soccer team, grandkids, that God is orchestrating a divine appointment for you. And we're just not aware. Oh, my feet found me a number of years ago, 30,000 feet above the ground. I was flying home from uh, my high school reunion um, in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was thinking about a similar series on sharing your faith and being an effective witness and I, I think I had some books out and a Bible out. And the guy next to me goes, hey, are you religious? Oh, he's like, when they say, are you religious? Why, yes, I'm a holy man, actually. <laughs> and because I really wanted to get the work done, I almost wanted to say yes. But I'm working on some thoughts about divine appointments and learning how to have effective spiritual conversations. So would you please leave me alone? <laughs> no, no, I know that sounds kind of cute, but... That's really what I thought. I thought, dude, I'm working on divine appointments. And then you go, oh, oh. And uh, I self-corrected immediately. And uh, for the next hour, uh, couple hours, you know, we had this wonderful dialogue that actually um, continued for several years. So after Jesus mentioned living water, the Samaritan woman is confused because Jesus is talking on one level and she's kind of living in the, another love. She's in the physical realm. Jesus is in the physical and the spiritual realm. So here's what John tells us what happens next, what the woman asks. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. 
Jesus is talking about living water, and she's confused. She's, wait a minute, this is a well. Living water for her in the physical realm would have been from a stream. Fresh, cool, living water. The, the water in a well was fairly stagnant. You could drink it, but it's not fresh and cool. And so she said, where are you going to get this living water? Has the heat gotten to you? You know, are, are you greater than Jacob? You know, one of the, the, the big prophets. Are you greater than Jacob? Who built, I mean, how are you going to get living water out of that? So she's really, uh, she's really um, confused. But Jesus uses the term living water in a different sense, in a spiritual sense. Uh, the Jewish people often spoke of the thirst for the soul and the way of quenching that thirst, that spiritual thirst, was with living water. Of course, we understand uh, because of Jesus' teaching, living water is the Holy Spirit living in us. Um, the living God provides living water for the dead and dry soul. So, uh, you know, the women's, the women's confused and it's understandable. This is difficult to understand. Uh, the faith is difficult to understand for Samaritans. The faith is difficult to understand for us as well. There are aspects of the faith that have lots of meaning, but there's tons of mystery, tons of mystery. Um, so another aspect of becoming an effective witness or having spiritual conversations that have impact uh, is listening. Listening to people's stories, listening to people's perspectives, listening to people's questions and objections. Um, we have a, a heart of compassion, uh, feet that go, and just ears, ears that listen. Um, People have, his, people have questions. People have stereotypes to overcome. People have bad experiences to overcome, to hear or hear it again or, or hear it afresh. And last week we looked at 1 Peter uh, where it said, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And part of being gentle and respectful is listening, is asking questions. You know, what, what is it you, you believe? And so when I was uh, talking to this guy in the plane, I, I asked him lots of questions. I learned about his family background, his spiritual background, his questions, his objections. Um, and, you know, I think if I, I did have his kind of experience, I would not have faith either. He had some legitimate reasons why he was turned off or put off by Jesus' experiences and intellectual questions. Um, so I sent him a couple books, and, and I put this in your program, I think. I, I recommend at least five books. Um, Letters to a Skeptic by Greg Boyd, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel, The Reason for God, Tim Keller, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, or The Purpose Driven Life. These, these are books you can uh, read them first or skim them first or read them with someone that you can just hand out. Uh, and that's part of being an effective witness. Hey, you want to read this book together? Okay? Uh, they're in your program if you, if you want to look this up. So after the woman says, where can I go to get this water? Uh, Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring welling up to eternal life. Again, the woman's confused. What are you talking about? The water that I drink from, I have to keep coming back. Well, the woman knows that. She has to come every day. She has to come every day to meet her needs. Her, her, her drinking, her washing, her, her, uh, her family needs, maybe her garden needs water. But Jesus says, if, if you take the water I give you, You'll never thirst again. Again, she doesn't understand. And so another part of being an effective uh, uh, witness is a heart of compassion, feet that walk, ears that listen, but also a mouth that speaks. There comes a time where we do need to say words. Last uh, week, I, I, I shared a, a quote from, uh, I think, Francis of Assisi, where he said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. And so he was, he was leaning into the fact that, that our lifestyle, you are a witness, right? So next week when I ask the question, you're all going to say, yep, I was a witness this week. Right? At all times, preach the gospel at all times. And when it's necessary, use words. It is necessary a lot of the times. It is necessary. And next week we're going to talk about what are, what are two uh, aspects of, of what we should learn uh, to, to, to say. And again, Jesus says, those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. What are you talking about? Jesus, what, what is this water that... that that, that will, will, will satisfy all my needs. What is this water you're, you're speaking of? What, what is this? And see, again, for the woman, it was the well water. What's the water, what's the water for you? What's the well that you continually go to to, to meet your needs, but, it, but you got to keep coming back because you leak again. We leak. 
For many, for me at times, it's you know, uh, recognition or attention. Some go to the, to, to the, uh, the well label sex or sexuality, but they have to keep coming back because it doesn't quite fulfill. Other wells are called addictions or alcohol or drugs or food or success or acceptance. And, and like, like the woman at the well, we have to kind of keep going back, keep going back, because we're satisfied for a season at the well, but then we go away and, and we're just, we just find, gosh, I guess I got to go back to that well again. And so the problem with the, these kind of wells is that, that they don't bring lasting joy. They don't bring lasting peace. They don't bring lasting satisfaction. In fact, a famous songwriter, theologian, if I can quote him, found out that in his own life, marked by success and women and popularity and money and fame, it didn't, didn't fill him up. In fact, this theologian songwriter wrote these profound words. He said, I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried, but I can't get no bum, bum, bum satisfaction. Who sang that song? Mick Jagger, right? He found out. And his sentiment, that song echoes what Jesus is saying here. Don't you find that to be true? Augustine, a church father, said this, Our hearts are restless until it finds its rest in you, O God. Our hearts are restless until it finds its rest in you, O God. Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. Don't you find that to be true? That there's not only bad things in the well, there are good things in the well. Good relationships, family, home, kids, work, success, all those things can be good, but there's a yearning in our soul that those good things can't fully satisfy. Uh, I played uh, football in, in high school, and I love football. One of my heroes uh, was Tom Brady, everybody's hero, and uh, not everybody's, but 18 years ago, he was interviewed by 16 Minutes, and he, 60 Minutes, and he had, uh, 16 Minutes, that's the, the follow-up show, it got cut, uh, 60 Minutes, Tom Brady, and uh, by this time, he'd made millions and millions of dollars, he was married to a supermodel, he'd won the Super Bowl three times, and he was only 29 years old, and in this very transparent and revealing interview, he says these words on 60 Minutes. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings, and and still think there's something greater out there for me. I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is, me, I thank God. It's gotta be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it, I'm 27, and what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew, I wish I knew. I mean, it's, I think that's part of me trying to go out and experience other things. But that's good. There's a, Isn't that good? I, know, I love playing football and Wait, I love being Here's this guy that, that, and since that time, he's won four more Super Bowls. He has seven Super Bowl rings, the greatest co uh, football player, supposedly, that ever has played. And I still think if you asked him that question, he'd say, he'd say God, I wish I knew. Ah, you're close. But I just love that transparency. There's got to be more than this. Well, in the earthly realm, what more do you want, Tom? But, but I think he's sensing something at the well, even though you have seven Super Bowl rings and you know, uh, models all over the place and beautiful homes all over the place and, and beautiful looking kids. It, there's got to be more than this. And that's what's going on in this story. After Jesus offered this living water, the woman asked this question. She says, sir, give me this living water. I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. But, but, you know, just based on you coming to Samaria, talking to a woman, I'm going to trust you. I don't get what you're talking about, but, but can I have it, please? Go give it to me, please. Now, if I were reading this for the first time, I would have thought Jesus would have said, Praise you, Father in heaven. Yes, here's, here's how to become a follower of me. Follow me. But he had one other thing to take care of that's critical. The story continues. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. 
Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Ouch. She's, she's open. She's, she says, Lord, give me this water. And Jesus knows there's, there's something in her soul. There's suffering, deep suffering, and there's sin. It's common to all of us. There's suffering at various levels that you have now or have had in the past. And there's sin in all of our lives. And before, before a relationship with Jesus can be fully embraced, we need to deal with suffering and sin. And so Jesus says, go call your husband. And it's not in the text, but here's how the women responded. The woman said, No, 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 I, 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 no, I know no, stop, that my stop. Sorry, I didn't mean to do it then. I think the woman was like, oh my gosh, how does he know? I, 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 I don't have a husband, she says. Jesus says, yeah, that's right. Gentle. He doesn't say, that's right, sinner! He doesn't say that. He says, you're right. And the fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. Actually, what you've said is quite true. You are a truth teller. That's a good thing. See how gentle he is? Five husbands. What happened to the five husbands? A lot of time I hear this taught, you know, oh, she's just an immoral, bad woman. Maybe. Or maybe three of her husbands died and she got divorced. A, a man could divorce a woman like that in that culture. A woman could not divorce a man. Maybe two of them died and three of them, maybe all five of them divorced her and left her. And if you're a woman in that culture without a husband, you turn to prostitution. There's, there's not much else. And so Jesus meets her in her pain. He says, I know your pain. And other places, come to me, all of you who are burdened, who are overwhelmed, and I'll give you peace, I'll give you rest. Well, Jesus is a grace giver, but <laughs> he's also a truth teller, right? So when I came to, to, to faith, I felt God's grace and forgiveness and love. But then you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jamie, there's this, 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 this. And, you know, and it's not to condemn the woman. He doesn't condemn her, but he tells the truth to convict her. It's the kindness of God that convicts us to bring us to repentance and new life. See, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm not that bad. Where what they're really saying is I'm, I'm a mis I make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, you correct the mistakes. But Jesus and the scriptures say we're not just mistakers, we're sinners. Mistakers look for a, a teacher or a guru or a book to fix the problem, and those aren't necessarily bad. But, but sinners, when you know you're a sinner, when you fall short of God, you, you look for a savior that can rescue you, and this is what Jesus is, is doing. Now, the woman realizes that Jesus is something special, but she's still confused by all this, and so she says this. Go ahead, David. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. See, the one being witnessed to by Jesus becomes the one now witnessing. Jesus' style is pretty direct, right? Direct. Her style is relational and invitational. She went back to her village, relational and testimonial. Come and see, invitational, a man who told me everything I ever did. Wow, that must have been a long conversation, right? She's sharing her testimony. Hey, you don't argue with that. She says, hey, this guy, told, this guy knows me. This guy met me. This guy from Jerusalem, this Jew, came into Samaria and talked with me. There's something about him. 
He's touching my life. Just come and see for yourselves. See a man who told me everything I ever did. And while the woman runs off, encouraging the town to come to Jesus, the disciples come back. And Jesus says to the disciples, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. He says, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look, look, look. See, perceive what's going on around you. They are ripe for harvest. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. In other words, there are people, most of the time when we give a witness, whether in word or deed, we're just planting a seed. We're maybe bringing someone from minus 10 to minus 6, hopefully not the other way. But that happens a lot, right? They have a church experience or experience with, with, with a Christian, and, and they move from minus 5 to minus 25. They say, oh, that's what a Christian is like. No, thank you. But a lot of times when we witness, we're just, we're just moving people. But Jesus is saying, no, that has already happened to a lot of people around you. Just invite them, and they will come to faith. And that's exciting. Jesus says, open your eyes. Look, there's a harvest. And so the last image I want to, and being an effective witness, we, we need hearts of compassion that have a sense of urgency. Feet that will go out, ears that listen, mouths that speak, but eyes that perceive what's going on. Everyone, everyone that you and I come in contact with, whether they look or act successful and happy and joyful, and they are perhaps, they still have a well that they go to to, to fill that void that the Tom Brady's of this world still have. Still have. Jesus is inviting us to experience spiritual conversations. There are at least a dozen people in my life who planted seeds of faith in me with their words or with their deeds that have no idea. No idea. I shared this with the Bible study this past week. There's a, uh, there's a, a RA I had named Mike Sullivan <laughs> in my freshman year at Miami uh, University in Ohio. Um, and Mike was a devout Christian guy. And I, I really liked Mike, but he was different. It's just different. I mean, he said stuff like, I love you, man. Okay, good for you. You know, I'll pray for you. Pray away, Mikey. You know, do you want to come to Bible study? No, thank you. God bless you. God loves you. Good, I love me too. You <laughs> catch, catch the drip? But, but Mike, Mike shared the faith with me. And the way he lived, and the way he talked, the way he treated me, I've lost touch with Mike. But when we get to heaven, you know what Mike's going to go? you got to be kidding me! <laughs> right? There are people that you'll share your life with, words with, actions with, that are planting seeds. And sometimes we get to see them come to faith. And by the way, you don't have to be perfect. My roommate all through college was a devout Christian, and he witnessed to me by how we reacted when he messed up. He witnessed to me by how his remorse, his repentance. Now, I'm not advocating sin evangelism here. Hey, that sounds like fun. I think I'll mess up a lot, and then I'll repent in front of them. No, no, that's not fine. My point is we don't have to be perfect. We have to be real and transparent and seek to follow God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So here's the prayer I want to challenge you with again. Uh, Lord, help me to be aware that I'm a witness for you today. Open up to me this day a divine appointment and, and help me share with the faith and how I live and in what I say. Okay, that's in your program. I'm going to email it to you a few times. Just remember, okay? I might even call some of you randomly. <laughs> and I'll use another number so it doesn't say... Pastor Jamie's calling. <laughs> Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. It's, an, it's, a, it's a privilege. It's a way to bring joy and power into our lives. But it's also how the kingdom of God advances one person at a time, through you and through me. Gracious and loving God, we thank you just for the power of story. And the story of Jesus, um, you know, we know it pretty well, but it's just, 
just fill with life. So help us to be who we already are, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and your witnesses. And we pray in your name. Amen.